A very wealthy society lady died and went to heaven, and as she looked about, she noticed that her maid, who had died some time before her, was living in a very beautiful mansion, while she herself was assigned to a rather insignificant little house. Immediately she complained to St. Peter, Don't you know who I am? I am so-and-so, and yet I find that my maid has a much more splendid accommodation than I have. What is the meaning of all this? St. Peter replied, I'm sorry that you are so disappointed. You see, we can only build out of what you sent up here. And we did the best we could for you out of what you sent us up while you were still on earth. The poor in spirit will have no problems in this regard. Poverty in spirit is not synonymous with being materially hard up. Having said that, Jesus does at times come down rather hard on the rich. He once described the Pharisees as being lovers of money. He has harsh words, for instance, to say about Dives, who ignored the poor man Lazarus. Dives was dressed in purple and fine linen and feasted, not just now and again, but actually every day. He knew how to look after number one, but putting it mildly, it didn't turn out too for good for him in the end. But then there is another side of the story. Take Zacchaeus. The Gospel describes him as a very wealthy man. A lot of his money would have been acquired by rather dubious means, so he was no angel. But when everyone was pointing the finger at him, Jesus calls him down from the tree, invites him to his house by saying, Zacchaeus, hurry down, I'm going to stay at your house today. His conversion is one of the more humorous stories in the New Testament. Perhaps here is a good example of someone who, even though he was very well off, became poor in spirit overnight. And then what about the rich young man? As they say, he wasn't without a bob or two. And the Gospel says that Jesus looked at him and loved him. If he could just distance himself from his wealth and follow Jesus, he'd be building up treasure in heaven. But for this young man, that was a bridge too far. If he had done as Jesus asked, he would have joined Zacchaeus in being poor in spirit, but he turned it down. And I have to say, he went home a rather sad man. We could compare it to what the Bushmen of Africa used to do to catch monkeys. They would put a jar high up on a tree and some food, which monkeys are very fond of, into the jar. This in turn would be tied to an object on the ground. And when the monkey puts his paw, he grabs the food, but with his paw filled with food, he's unable to pull it out. And since he won't let go, he's easily caught. The rich young man became trapped by his wealth. We could easily become trapped too. Jesus says, you cannot be a slave both of God and of money. The poor in spirit have put their life and destiny into God's hands regardless of their financial situation. When Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, I think he was referring to those people, whether they are materially rich or poor, who dare turn money or the craving for it into some kind of God. Even less well-off people can be infected by the money bug. And indeed, the opposite can also be the case. A well-heeled person can at heart be poor in spirit if he is generous and sees everything he owns as God's gift and he knows deep down that acquisitions and money are only on loan to us. He also doesn't judge people by the, side of their, by the size of their bank balance. He knows that money is, as they say, made round to go round and one day we'll all have to give an account to God as to how we spend the stuff. I think you'll always know a person who is poor in spirit by how generous they are. I can't see how tight-fisted people can ever inherit the kingdom of God unless they have a change of heart. I think that the story in the gospel about the widow's might is a little gem. Even though the rich put in a quite a bit on that particular day, the widow went the whole hog and she parted with everything she had to live on. Jesus praised the widow for her generosity and later said, The amount you measure out is the amount you're going to be given back. If one of our priorities in life is just pampering ourselves and our family, then we can hardly claim to be poor in spirit. This is what Jesus says. A man's life is not made secure by what he owns even when he has more than enough. I think the bottom line is that a poor in spirit person places his life and destiny in God's hands and by using his possessions wisely in this world for the betterment of others, he is laying up treasure in heaven. 
He relies on God and not on things of, fle of flesh. If such a person were to lose everything, it wouldn't spell the end of the world. He is well aware that the old burial shroud has no pockets. And as the psalmist says, in God alone is my soul at rest. God is my salvation, not money, or land, or houses, or cars, not even people who can be so devious at times where money is concerned. I think one of the more striking characteristics of the world we live in is that we are ardent consumers of worldly goodies. And with Christmas coming up, all those children, hidden persuaders will be out there tempting us to spend more and more, mostly on things we don't even need. But for the poor in spirit, Christmas will be more about giving rather than receiving. And we should teach our children and grandchildren how to do precisely that. There is a humorous tale about a man's granddaughter who eagerly searched under her pillow one morning after putting her fallen out tooth there the night before. She burst into tears after discovering that the tooth had not been replaced by a coin during the night. Trying to comfort her, the grandpa said, Darling, you don't still believe in those silly old fairy tales, do you? Maybe not, she replied, but I still believe in money. And what about the RE teacher who was taking our class of 10 year olds when she suddenly asked, Now, why do you think the children of Israel made a golden calf? The children were silent until one little boy raised his hands and said, Please miss, perhaps it was because they didn't have enough gold to make a cow. What kind of example are we giving to our up-and-coming generation to help them become poor in spirit like our Lord? Jesus wasn't born in a stable just for the fun of it. He became poor for our sake. He had nowhere to lay his head. When the devil offered him all the kingdoms of the world in the desert in exchange for his worship, he sent him packing. The poor in spirit know that only God can bring them lasting fulfilment. Henrik Ibsen, the great Danish playwright, once said, Money can bring you the husk of many things, but not the kernel. It can bring you delicious food, but not appetite. Medicine, but not health. Acquaintances, but not friends. Days of joy, but not lasting peace. Whatever we have in this world, we use it wisely for the sake of others. Jesus said, Use money, that tainted thing, to win you friends, so that when it fails you, those same friends will welcome you into the tents of eternity. A lot of people who have near-death experiences say that you enter a tunnel at the end of which is a magnificent light, and out of the light come the people whom you have loved and helped in this world. They come with arms outstretched, longing and beckoning the person to join them. But their time is not up, and they end up back in their body. When our tent on earth is folded up, who will surge forward to greet us and welcome us into the tents of eternity? I would say that the poor in spirit need have no worries in this regard. Thank you for watching and God bless you all.